So what is revival? So I'm going to speak about revival and steps to revival. That's basically my topic. And this is taken from the book Steps to Revival by Pat Robbins, R Robertson. So the, the outlines are from him. And, and this simple, the, the outline is sim simply from one particular Bible verse, which all of us are familiar with. And that is from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. But before that, let me paint a picture of what is revival. So that we'll, I, I put a definition of the revival there, which is by uh, Pat Robertson. It says, heaven with its glory and grace invades our human condition. And in the light of God's glory, the allure of the world with its pleasures and material possessions loses its hold on us while our hearts are truly satisfied with the presence of God. As we draw closer to God, the sin in our lives, in the line these words, the sin in our lives, which we first accepted as normal, becomes distasteful and become loathsome. That's the kind of revival that we're looking at. Job in the Bible was referred to as the most righteous person in his generation. But when he, he looked face to face with God, when the holiness of God shines upon him, he sees his sin and he says this. Job says this, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. When your spiritual eyes sees God's glory, God's holiness, and he says this, Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. When you know that there is sin in you, when the Lord shines his light upon you, the sin is being revealed and we will, we will say like Job and say, I will repent in dust and ashes. When the Lord brings revival in any country, in every, any parts of the world, he will first purify his people in the church. He will first purify, he will first cleanse, he will bring fire and, and, and cleanse it, and people will be repenting every time. Every time we come together, every time he sits in, in, his, in his closet, people will be repenting. Repentance will be a huge mark of revival. Steps to revival, as I said, is taken from one, one verse, and that is one, uh, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble, and pray to, and seek my face, seek my face three, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayer and forgive their sin and heal their land called Dwarka and Delhi. Amen. Oh, where's your faith? Are you listening or something? Yes, we want to see revival happening here in DCC, in Dwarka, and in Delhi. That's the faith. I'm not going to compromise anything less than that. Have we not sang the song? I will not settle for any ordinary things. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? No, we will not settle for small things. It's not smaller than revival. Than revival. So people must be thinking now, Are you, Pastor, I thought we were talking about renewal initially. How is, it, how is this revival happening now? How did this happen? I said this is a gradual progression from renewal to revival. It is by default, we should have revival. We should have revival. So the first one, as from this verse, the first one is humility. Humility is the first step. So all of us as a church, and those of you who are in the Zoom, I'm sure you are humble enough. That's why you have quietly come and joined with us on the Zoom. Thank you for your humility. Humbleness or humility, that's the first one. The first sin that is recorded in the Bible is pride. P-R-I-D-E. My, my Northeast pronunciation 
will confuse you sometimes, but don't worry. That's how we have been brought up. All right? Yes. Pride, P-R-I-D-E. That's the first sin recorded in the Bible. And we need to deal with it. Deal with it. That was Satan. Satan became so proud and he wanted to become like God himself. And he was pushed down or cast away from heaven and came down to earth. And now ever since then, he became the enemy of God and he's our arch enemy. You know the story about the tax collector and the Pharisee? They went, it's, it's a parable taught by Jesus. They both went to the temple, that is the church, and uh, the, the, the tax collector is right there in the corner, ba- at the back seat. The Pharisee came closer here, just like me. Pastors, leaders, they came. He came right in front, and he was telling God, God, I fasted two times, you know. Better to record that. I don't do like this guy who is, who is there right behind there. He, but he is a sinner. Whereas that sinner, the tax collector, he was beating his heart and, and, uh, and repenting of his sin. And, and Jesus said, He went home cleansed. We, when we humble ourselves and confess our sins, we went home, we will go home being cleansed and we'll go home rejoicing. This morning you have a choice to go back home empty-handed with full of pride and go home. Nothing will change. Or... You can beat to your heart and say, I'm a sinner. Lord, please help me. Please forgive me. I need your forgiveness right now. I want to settle the account right now. Here itself. I don't want to carry this sin with me to my home. You have a choice to do that. You have a choice to do that. The second one is about a prayer. Prayer. Prayer is so important. We are asked to pray without ceasing, without stopping. Continuous prayer. Now, there's a story that uh, Jesus, a parable that Jesus told about a neighbor who happened to have a guest all of a sudden in, at night, and he went to another neighbor. Let's say uh, Mr. Y had a guest, and Mr. X is sleeping. Mr. Y went to X's house and Y is knocking at the door and say, Hey, neighbor, can you give me a bread, please? Because my guest has come and I need that immediately. But the other person is sleeping. So I have sl- slept already. My, my wife and everybody is in the bed already. So please don't disturb us now. He shut the door. But then the neighbor will not give up. He will keep on knocking and pounding the door, pounding and pounding. So at the end, he just got up. He took the bread from his fridge and, and shoved it out. I said, get lost. What is the moral of the story? It is not the love of that man who got up from the bed. No, no, no. He does not have love at all. Zero love. No friendliness, no relationship. He has no pity on that guest also. He has nothing to do with that guest. But what wouldn't that story that, that morning or that night is? The desperation of his neighbor. The desperation of his neighbor. Say desperation. Desperation. Say desperation. desperation. I want to be desperate in my prayer. I want to be desperate in my prayer. Are you desperate in your prayer? Or prayer is just a convenience for you. Whenever I get time, God, I will pray to you. Until then, hold your peace. <clears throat> I like New, New Living Translation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 8. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Keep on knocking. Keep on knocking. Every Friday evening, we come here in the church and we pray for only one thing, only one agenda. That's revival. 
we've been doing that. Persevering. And we will not give up. We will not give up. We will persevere in this. We will persevere in this. In fact, Auntie Sheila, the other day, uh, she said, let's commit ourselves to God and commit ourselves to this prayer for revival, all of us. So let's say one by one, one by one. So all of us, we pray one by one about our commitment to praying for the revival. We have committed ourselves to pray until we see revival in our church. And my challenge for all of us is that, would you like to join to prayer on Friday evening? I understand the Sunday morning chaos. You have a children. So I understand. But Friday evening, the weekend is going to start. And it's 8.30. If you're working later than 8.30, there's something wrong with that work culture. You need to come home on time. As a, as a pastor, I'm telling you. Come home on time. That will set a lot of peace in your home. And God has promised us, if we keep knocking at the door, if we keep praying, this is what happens. Jeremiah 29, verse 12 to 13. In those days, when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. You will find me. So that's the, that's the promise of God. In those days, when you pray, I will listen. When you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. When some of us, when some of us wholeheartedly pray to God for revival, he will bring revival. He will bring revival. In the history of revivals in different parts of the world, we've seen just some handful of people, faithful handful of people praying day and night. Hi hybridis in Scotland, I don't know how to pronounce it, hybridis or hybrids or whatever, that, that name which is very difficult to pronounce in, in Scotland, in that revival when it happened, two old women were praying, 84 years, blind women, a blind woman and her sister who is filled with arthritis. Those two sick Women prayed for revival. Bam, it happened. That's the fate of that kind of people. And God is looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That club is for Jesus, not for me. Yes, that's for Jesus. Seeking God's face. That's the third one according to that verse. Seeking God's face. Seeking God's face. You know, seeking God's face is different from praying. Praying is that you have a list of things that you pray and ask the Lord, please do this, do this. But seeking God's face is higher, I would say, that's higher than prayer. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 and 26, which, is, which has become so popular all over the world because of this song, The Blessings, by Gary Job and, and her husband, right? So they sang this song about the blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turns his face toward you and give you peace, right? I have to be a little more religious, you know, sound like a real priest and with that tone. This is about seeking the face of God and God's face shining upon you. The favor of God rests upon you because you are not acting like a child, but you're acting like a matured son and daughter of God, willing to spend time with him in the presence of God. As the song says, no? Open up the sky. Open up the sky. We sang this a couple of times. Last week also we sang and it says this. The song is up there. It says, open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings. We want God. Open up the sky, fall down like fire. We don't want anything but you, Lord. 
our beloved Jesus. We just want to see you in the glory of your light. Earthly things don't matter. They just fade and shatter when we are touched by the love divine. That is seeking the face of God. Most of us, most of us, sadly, our prayer is full of marketing lists. Tick one, two, three, four, five. There is no love relationship between you and God. There's no love relationship. God is something like you ask him and he gives you. You pray, you love God in a way so that you can get something out of him. And that's why many of our prayers did not get any answer. Any answer. So my petition or my appeal to all of us is that let's go beyond this petition stage. When we were, ch we were children, when we were toddlers, we just cry whenever we want to do anything. When we, we want anything, food, we cry. Thirsty, we cry. Right? But when we are matured, we sit with our father and talk to him about his business. Talk to him about family business. And now we think like our father thinks. And that's what God is looking for. Seeking his face. And the fourth point. Turn from our wicked ways. Turn from our wicked ways. Turn from our wicked ways. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 says this. Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to see God until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. It's very interesting. He, he talks about unplowed ground. Israelites, the story of Israelites are very, very relatable to me because I come from a farming background and they, are, they have this farming and so I can immediately relate about unplowed ground. It's, it's, it's something like this. Unplowed ground is, is not completely a, a, a virgin mountain where you have to start cultivating. No, no. People have cultivated that place but then for certain years, they have not been cultivating. It's not been tilted, so the land is lying vacant, barren. We, in our, in our dialect, we call it Rambhoghai. And it's full of grass, and, uh, and now the small, small plants and, and small trees have started growing in that paddy field. And one has really taken a huge knife and cut down these small trees and grasses first, burned them up, and after that, we dig dig the ground, and then fill it with water and keep it there for a few weeks so that the, 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 the mud becomes soft and then we plow it either with, with spade or with the help of some poor animals. We plow them. Then it becomes fertile. Some of us, we have met Christ. We have surrendered to, to, to Christ, but... We have started neglecting reading the Bible or praying or, or neglecting meeting believers like this in the church or in the cell group. And slowly we drift away without realizing that I am going away from God. And then now slowly my value system becomes, becomes more like the world system is. Our languages become more coarse and more dirty, but we didn't realize that. We will just use it as if that's, that's fine. Your conscience has no, uh, it has become numb. Even if you speak bad words, it's like everyone, every, everyone is saying that, so what? That's the time we say that's an unplowed ground needed a lot of work. A lot of work. A lot of work. And for that kind of heart, that kind of heart condition, just by attending a church on Sunday morning will not do at all. This is not sufficient. Just by saying a, a, a toss of prayer just before your, your meal or, or just before you go to bed, that will not do any good to your unplowed heart or hardened heart. My suggestion will be, as I have done, my suggestion would be take a, take a 
a blank sheet of paper, take your, take your pen, put it on a table, kneel down and cry out to God and say, Lord, please bring to my mind things that I have taken it for granted. All those sinful activities that I have involved recently, bring it to my mind and help me to repent today genuinely and start writing down. Start writing down. I mean, I can remind us so many sins that we have taken it for granted. Think about your Bible reading. Now, I'm not being legalistic, but you don't love the word of the Lord. And how can you ever claim that you love God? Think about your father here, right here, uh, a physical father. If you say, I just don't like the, the voice of my father. Mm. But I love my father. How does that? How does that connect? It does not make sense. When your father said, baby, come here. <sighs> I have to go. And then when you talk to people, I love my father. Mm. I can see that. I can see that you love, her, you love your father so much. You don't love the word of the father. But you want the blessing of your father. Is it not? That's what ha what's happening with us. Most of us, just like the prodigal son and prodigal son's uh, elder brother, they like the, the wealth and the wealth of the father, but not father. We need to change. We need to change. Worship, approval, approval of God is much more important, but now we have left the approval of God and look for the approval of people. What my neighbors will think, what my, pe what my people will think, what my church members will think, that seems to be more important. Wrong. Wrong. We need to turn away from these wicked things that we have engaged in. And when we repent, it is not a general repentance. Oh Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinful man, as it is everybody is sinful. So please forgive me. We don't repent like that. That's why I said, write it down. I, I have this pride issue, this sin of pride. Please forgive me, Father. I have this sin of lust. Please forgive me, Father. I have this sin of anger issue. Please forgive me, Father. Write it down. Write it down. And confess your sin. Ask the Lord and receive. See, the, the objective is just not to pour out your, your dirt and filth upon him and then go away. No, the object and the aim is to receive his forgiveness so that you will walk in freedom. That's the objective. And when you, when you take out all the filth and dirt from your heart, there is freedom. There is joy. That's what we're looking at. Just like King David, search me, oh God, and know my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. We sang this hundred times and never from the heart. That's the problem. We need to repent so that we receive forgiveness and walk in freedom. Walk in freedom. Some of us, we're married. I hope we are we are in good condition or good terms with our spouses. The Bible says that if I have a problem with my wife, Achui, my prayers will not be answered. And I think it is the same for her also. So as married people, we need to have a loving, peaceful relationship with our spouse. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Even if, if I feel that I'm wrong, I'm right, and she's totally wrong in our conflict, I must take the initiative, and you must take the initiative and say, I'm sorry. For whatever it is, I don't want to justify. Let's come together and pray together and give this to the Lord. And let's love and, and, and compromise, reconcile. And when we have this broken and contrite heart, the Lord will heal us. The Lord will hear, hear us. Isaiah 57 from verse 15. The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this. 
I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. The Lord dwells and lives with people whose hearts are humble and contrite. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those who repent, whose, whose hearts are repentant. That's the heart of our heavenly Father. He restores the crushed spirit, the crushed spirit of the humble. Revive the courage of those who, whose hearts are repentant. And when we have written down all the sins, we don't need to meditate on it. We don't need to put it under, under our pillow. We need to take a matchbox and burn it and forget it. Move on, receive the forgiveness, and live in freedom. Walk in freedom. The Bible says in, in Psalms 103, verse 12, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. He has removed us, removed the sins away from us, and He has never remembered again and have uh, held that against us. He's forgiven and forgotten. It's we who has the problem. We need to move on. And he will cleanse us again and again, again and again. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all of us from our sins again and again on a daily basis. The blood of Jesus will purify us on a daily basis. And that's what, when we turn away from our wicked wickedness, the Lord will will hear us. Renewal is just around the corner. Revival is just around the corner. The next point, that's unity. It's so important. The, 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 the verse does not mention about unity, but it is just a common sense, right? If there is a strife in our church, if there is a conflict in our church, where is the question of revival happening in the church? No way. We need to have peaceful relationship. Peaceful relationship, loving relationships. That is so important for us. In my limited knowledge, the stories about the revivals happening around the world, it always happened with a group of people praying together in one place, in one place. A court. In one place, in one heart, when they pray together, revival happens. Oneness of heart. So if there is a conflict among us, you are the hindrance to the revival. And I don't want to be a hindrance to the revival. Don't think that you're waiting on God. God, what happened to you? Why are you not sending the revival? And God is telling us, what happened to you? I'm waiting for you. Change your heart. Repent. I am waiting for you. I want to just send the revival right away. But your heart is not ready. So don't think that God is reluctant to send revival in Dwarka or in Delhi. He is ever willing. That is the core of his heart. God is waiting on us. Change your heart. Change your heart. Matthew chapter 18 verse 19 says, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you honored agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. How much more when the church come together and pray together. This morning we see how the Lord touched our sister Kim. And I believe that that's because all of us, we were together in that prayer. We were in one accord this morning. All of you, I can see your hands stretch up with full of faith. And the Lord came graciously, wonderfully. We need to do this. We need to do this. Before the Pentecost 
they happened in Acts chapter 2. The, this, the disciples of Jesus, they were waiting for that revival. Jesus has already promised them that I will send my comforter, my Holy Spirit, and he will baptize you. Now, they are waiting. Not for one day, but they come together every day and they wait on that. Not one day, two day, three days, three, four days. Went on almost 50 days. It's after this Passover that the 58 on the 58, 50 day that the Spirit came upon them on the Pentecost. Waiting period in unity is important is helpful for us as a church. And we need to wait in one accord, in, in, in unity, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The last point for this morning, and what a relevant name, perseverance. Persevere with me, brothers and sisters. This is the last point, okay? Now, oh yeah, so, Perseverance, we all need to persevere in our prayer, praying together. As I said, we, we, we pray together on, on Friday, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning. And, and in the cell groups, we, we are praying. Uh, and different, different leaders are meeting in different places, in different timings, and we are praying. And I think we need to just persevere in our prayer knowing that when we persevere in prayer, our hearts are being purified, refined by the Holy Spirit. It is just a refining process. We are becoming more and more pure in the sight of God. Perseverance is important. We are not changing God's mind. We're not trying to strangle him and, and, and manipulate him. No. It is God changing our hearts as we seek his face. Yes, we need to do that. We need to persevere in that. We need to persevere in that. And the last verse for us is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 and 36. It says, therefore, church, there is no church here, but I'm saying church, do not throw away your confidence that the revival will come which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance or perseverance so that when you have done all the will, uh, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You may receive what was promised as we persevere together in Christ. As we persevere, we will receive it. And now, in conclusion, I want to give you my picture of revival. Because, you see, whenever I pray something, I have a picture that I need to achieve that. Is it not? You also pray for something else. Let's say you pray for a job. You have, uh, you have something, the kind of job that you want to have, and you pray to God for that. You're not just blindly praying, praying that, Lord, just give me any job. Just any job will do. No, you have something in your heart. And, and like that, we as a church, we want to dream together a picture that we will, we will pray towards and persevere towards. And that's it. Phase one will be our church. The prayer movement will happen in our church. Prayer movement has begun. It will only increase. It will only increase and the prayer movement will be so excited for all of us as a church. Whenever we hear that there is a prayer, prayer meeting, all of us will jump out from the bed and say, Hallelujah, let's go there and let's go and pray. The excitement will just go up. People who were lazy before, they will, they will cut that laziness and, and jump out and come. There will be prayer movement. And the second is, whenever we come together, even in our private prayers also, our prayers will be filled with repentance of heart. Because revival comes as after a season of repentance, not only for yourself, but for your family, for the city. Full of repentance, repenting, 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 in ashes and in sackcloths. And then... 
we will see the revival in our church. We will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit every time we come together. And it will be tangible presence. It will be a tangible presence. People who walk into the door, they will feel the presence of God right from there. Right from there. As they enter, they will feel the thickness of the presence of God and they will say, here is a living God. Here is the living God. The living God dwells here. Something is different here. The atmosphere is the spirit of the Lord is filled with in, in this place. And people will, will feel that. People cannot miss it. We have heard the story of revivals, how, how even in that uh, hybridist revival, the, 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 the preacher was about to go out and he went to the door just to shake hands with people who are going out. And when he opened the door, he saw crowd of people gathered outside the church. Who has brought that? The Spirit of the Lord has brought people into the church. And we don't have to struggle. The Spirit of the Lord will bring people for repentance. There will be harvest of souls. Harvest of souls. And then there will be awakening in our city, subsidy of Dwarka, and there will be awakening in the city of Delhi.